mashallah, that was really amazing. Now, I'd like to invite the next speaker of this event who has come all the way from South Africa. He is really an amazing person who works a lot for Islam. And he is Sheikh Abi Muawiya Ismail Kandar, who at the age of 16 met Sheikh Ahmad Didad, rahmatullahi and was inspired to propagate the religion of Islam. And since then, he has been studying comparative religion and dawah techniques and doing dawah at every chance he gets. He completed three formal dawah courses, including a comparative religion course at the Islamic Propagation Center International, IPCI, in 2006. He also did dawah training course on the Islamic Online University under the guidance of Dr. Bilal Phillips in 2007 and the Dawah Power Course at Al Kawthor Institute under the guidance of Sheikh Kamal Al Maki of the USA in 2008. In the October 2006, he started the Islam the Truth Dawah Forum on the social network Port Digits, from where he has been doing Dawah to countless Muslim youth and non Muslims, and has changed the perception about Islam of so many people, alhamdulillah, while bringing many people closer to Islam. As of January 2008, his forum was viewed more than 300,000 times and is very popular, alhamdulillah. In the past, he worked as DAI for IIFRI, that is Islamic Interfaith Research Institute. He conducted Islamic workshops and taught Islamic studies in a madarsa for the underprivileged at ILMSA, that is Institute for Learning and Motivation, South Africa. He was educator of business studies, English, and social studies with Islamicized syllabus for Al-Fajr International School, Chennai. Currently, he is a tutor assistant of BA in Islamic studies on the subjects of Aqidah, Arabic, Fiqh, Tafsir for IOU, Islamic Online University. He is also Arabic tutor and youth workshop conductor for Dean Class. For more details, you can visit deanclass.com. He is an active blogger on www.muslimmatters.org. He is a radio lecturer for various programs including Mercy to the Universe, Women Around the Prophet, and the Widely Guided Caliphs on Radio Al-Ansar of South Africa. He is MashaAllah radio guest for various programs including Nasiha Today, Intellectual Challenge, and Sabahul Khair on Islam Channel. He is also currently teaching private Arabic classes and working on some future projects for Mercy Mission South Africa. So we have, alhamdulillah, all in one Sheikh with us today. So inshallah, I, I hope and I wish that you'll all benefit from Sheikh. I invite him to address us on the topic, God and you, what's your relationship? Over to Sheikh now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created each and every one of us and who has guided us to be part of this blessed event. And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of his messengers, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and the final messenger Muhammad, and everybody who followed their true way with righteousness right until the last day. We begin by praising Allah and thanking him for guiding us to be part of such events. Whatever our stand is in religion, whatever our stand is in life, the fact that we are sitting here for such an event shows that we have at least some connection with our Creator, that this topic has interested us. It has made us interested to come and see what does the speaker have to say about my relationship with God. We as human beings in general, we take a lot of our time to invest in relationships. We spend much of our time worried, is my mother happy with me? Is my spouse happy with me? Are my children happy with me? Is my boss happy with me? We have these relationships that we work on and much of our time goes just making sure that people who are important to us are happy with us. Yet, our Creator is more important than all of these people. Not to say they are not important, they are very important for us to live a peaceful and a stable life in this world. But our Creator is important for us to have peace in this world and in the next world. Yet how many of us stop and think to ourselves, what does God think about me? 
What does Allah think about me? What is my relationship with Allah? Am I his friend? Does he love me? Is he angry with me? What is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How often have you asked yourself this question? How often have you thought about this? Why, why don't we think about this, uh, about this topic in a hurry? Because this is something which affects us greatly. Our inner peace in this world depends on our relationship with Allah. Our inner peace. Inner peace is that contentment inside your heart. That you know what your purpose in life is. You work towards that purpose. You have a connection with your Creator. So you are at peace. Something goes wrong, Allah willed it. You are at peace. Things go right, or please it to Allah. You are at peace. You are at peace in all situations. You cannot get this if you don't have a close relationship with Allah. So this topic raises three questions in the mind of a listener. The first question is, what is my relationship with God? The second question is, what should be the ideal relationship with God? You know what where you stand, but what is the ideal? What should you be striving towards? And the final question is, how do we reach that ideal? What do we need to do to get there? So, we're going to begin by, inshallah, discussing the different relationships that human beings have with their Creator. From my interaction with people across the world, I have found about seven or eight different types of relationships that humans have with their Creator. Ranging from the worst, inshallah, towards the best, for the non-Muslim listeners, inshallah means if God wills, God willing. We always say this before when we talk about the future. So, the first type of person who has almost, or we can say he has no relationship with God whatsoever, is the atheist. Not only doesn't he think about God, but he doesn't believe in Him. And this is a very sad state of affairs to be in. Because if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in the afterlife, what is the purpose of your life? Why are you living? There has to be an emptiness on the inside. And only belief can fulfill this. So to such people, the first group, the atheists, and with them I'd like to mention the second group. The second group are people who don't say that God does not exist, but they say we don't know. We don't know if he exists or not. The agnostics. So to both of these groups, I want you to think about the following. You, you know, theoretically, if you are right, I have nothing to lose by being a good Muslim. But if I am right, you in major trouble if you die an atheist or an agnostic. It's not a small issue. It's something that's very serious. So you really need to take up time to think about it. Don't just think about it. When you're alone, pray. I mean, if God doesn't exist, will it hurt you to pray? Pray and make, pray to God that, Oh God, if you exist, show me proof of this. Show me the right way. It's not going to hurt you to do this in any way. So I ask anybody in the audience who might be an atheist or an agnostic to go ahead and do this. Between you and your Creator, nobody needs to know about it. That should be the first step to improving your relationship. Besides these two groups, we then have the type of people who believe in God. They do believe in Him, but they don't really care about Him. They don't really bother. You know, they'll say that we believe in God, we are God-fearing people, but they live their lives in such a way as if God doesn't exist. Most of the time the reason for this is that we're so busy trying to earn money, trying to pay the bills, trying to maintain our relationship with family members, and trying to have a bit of fun, that we don't take up time for our Creator. Our entire life has become a competition just to get the good things of this world. As Allah speaks about in the Quran, this competition to pile up the things of this world has diverted you. It has distracted you. Until you die, until you get to the grave, then you will know the reality. Then you will know the reality because then you will see the hellfire with your own sight. And then you will be asked about all the good things that God has given you. This is Surah Tatasir in the Quran, 
where Allah is warning us don't let this world distract you from your Creator. We can chase the world with halal means, with permissible means. We can do that. But it should not distract us from our Creator. It should be a secondary issue to us. That our Creator comes first and the world comes second. So for these people who are distracted, take out time and think about it. This is the most important relationship that you have. Your relationship with your Creator. The fourth type of person is the deist. These are the people who say God exists, but you know, we don't need to do anything. We are a small speck in the universe. We don't have any purpose. Why would God care what I do with my life? Now to this person, I'd like to ask a question. Do you know of anybody who invents something without a purpose? Anybody who creates or invents something which has no benefit to it? That he made it just like that? Yet you believe in a God who is so knowledgeable, who is so wise, that he created this universe so perfectly, and you think he left you without a purpose? You think he created you for fun? As Allah himself asks in the Quran, does mankind think Oh, in another verse he says before that he says that we did not create we referring to God in the plural the majestic plural we did not create the heavens and the earth and everything in between them for fun the word used in the Quran is la'iba fun we didn't do this for fun Allah did not create things just for fun to amuse himself there's a purpose for everything and there's a purpose why you and I exist he goes on to ask us in surah qiyamah does mankind think he'll be left alone without any accountability? God created you, the best creation on earth, the only creation that is aqil, that has intellect, that can think and decide for himself between good and evil, who, can, who Allah has given the ability to invent things like the airplane, things like the internet, like the mobile phones that we have, God has given us this intellect and we're not going to be held accountable for what we do. We are all going to be held accountable for sure. But what do we need to do? What is this purpose? Why do we exist? Why did God create us? In the Quran, He states it very simply. I did not create the genies nor the humans except to worship me. I need to divert a bit here because this word, Ya'budun, in the English translation, worship. It doesn't do justice to what the word Ya'budun means. The word worship seems to indicate rituals. It indicates, you know, just ritual worship. So when you tell someone our purpose in life is to worship Allah, they imagine 24 hours you are on the prayer mat praying to God. That is not what is meant by worship in Islam. Worship in Islam comes from the word Abd. Abd means to be a slave. To follow and to submit. When Allah says we do not create man or jinn except liya'budun, it means we do not create you except to submit to the will of God. So when we say our purpose in life is to worship God, it means to live our life within the boundaries set by God. To live our lives in obedience to God. Not necessarily rituals all the time. There are certain rituals that we have to do, but not all the time. But Everything we do needs to be within the boundaries set by God. This is our purpose. It's a test. It's a test to humanity. Allah has put you on earth. He has put many things before you. He has put many religions before you. Many ways of life. And He has given you the intellect to choose between right and wrong. Who will choose to submit to the Creator and who will choose to follow their desires. And be sure that there are repercussions for your choice. So this is my advice to those people who are not investing in a relationship with their Creator. We then have a group of people who I feel are very ungrateful to the Creator. They believe in God, definitely. But they treat Him like the genie in the bottle. When they want to make a wish, then they call upon God. When they need something, then they call upon God. These are the people, and sadly they, are, they exist amongst Muslims as well, who they don't practice they don't worship, but something goes wrong, they raise their hands, they say, oh God help me. 
and then they expect God to give them instant help even though they are not fulfilling God's rights. Now somebody might be asking, God's rights? Does God have rights over us? I will say, why not? We all talk about human rights so often. Every human being has rights, no doubt about it. If we have rights, don't you think the one who created us, gave us our intellect, gave us everything we have, don't you think he has rights? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told, he asked his companions, what is the right of God upon you? And his companions, they didn't know. So they said, God knows best. You know better than us. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, God's right upon you is that you pray to him, you worship him, and you don't worship anybody else. You don't pray to anyone else. Him alone. This is his right. And do you know what's your rights upon God? Imagine this, we have rights. God has, God is not responsible to anyone, but he has put rights of himself, you know, for us. The Sahaba said, what is it? He said that if you do this, if you worship God as he had asked you to, without worshiping anyone else, he must let you enter paradise forever. No one's forcing God to do this. This is his mercy. That he, in return for you fulfilling his rights, he has given you this right. That if you do this for God, he will repay you with this. So this third group of people, those who only contact God when they need him, if they need him, this is something that you need to think about. That this is not right. It's not right to do this to any person. Uh, I mean, if you only talk to your father when you want something from your father, naturally he's going to get angry with you. If you don't talk to your wife except when you need something from her, naturally she's going to get angry with you. If you don't treat people like this, how can you treat your, treat your own creator in this manner? This is not right at all. We move on to the next group of people. These are the people who might be religious, they believe in God, they worship Him, uh, but they have one major problem. And this is a very major problem. They worship others besides Him as well. Whether they regard these others as equals, or intermediaries, or you know, His demigods, or whatever it is, but they worship someone besides God. This goes back to what I just quoted from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that it's God's right not just to worship him, but you don't worship anyone else besides him. In fact, in Islam, we regard worshipping someone besides God as oppression. The word used in the Quran is zulm, oppression. Because oppression means to deny somebody their rights. So when you are praying to an idol or to a human being or to a grave, you are giving the rights of God to someone besides God. This is oppression. If we don't tolerate oppression of human beings, why do we take denying God His rights so lightly? This is why in Islam, it is the worship of besides God, which is known as shirk, is regarded as the only unforgivable sin if you die upon it. Any sin that you repent for in this life can be forgiven. But when you die, Allah might forgive you your sins, He might not. But if your sin was shirk, if it was major shirk, worshipping someone besides Him, that's the one sin He has promised never to forgive. Because He created you for a purpose, and now you are not fulfilling that purpose. If we buy, for example, if you buy a pen, the purpose of the pen is to write. If it doesn't fulfill the purpose, you throw it in the bin. So if you're not fulfilling your purpose, don't you think God might throw you in His bin? which is the eternal hellfire. So, for those people, whatever religion you may be following, I ask you to sincerely think about why do I worship someone besides God? If this one creator who created me, why do I need to worship a human or a prophet or an idol? God is there. He says in the Quran, call on me, I will answer you. There's no need to call on anyone else. No one else can help you if God is angry with you. So, this is the foundation of Islam, Tawheed, the belief in one God and the worship of this one God. So I ask anybody who is involved in any type of worship to besides God, I remember when we said worship, we said in Islam worship doesn't only mean rituals, obedience also is worship, where God tells you something and somebody tells you the opposite and you choose to obey them over God, this is also worship. So, in any form of worship that you do, 
to anyone besides God, you need to introspect, you need to think about it, and you need to work towards improving your relationship. The next type of person uh, who I'm going to sp uh, speak about is the one who has submitted his will to the will of God. That person who has submitted his will to the will of God. He is a person or she is a person who knows why they exist, they know why God created them, and they live their life following this way. This person in English, we say he has submitted to the will of God. One word for that in Arabic is, he is a Muslim. She is a Muslim. And the word for submission to the will of God is Islam. This is what Islam is. It's not a religion per se. It's a way of life. The way of life of worshipping God and submitting to Him in your life, in everything that you do. So, in essence, being a Muslim is the primary relation that every human should try and establish between themselves and God. A relationship that God created me, He gave me everything I have, from my intelligence, to my personality, to whatever else He has given you, wealth, children, family, the least I can do in return is to worship Him. And here I want to just divert a bit uh, to look at what is meant by worship in Islam. Because you know, lots of times people might think, oh, we need to worship God, we are going to sit and pray all day, you know, it's going to be difficult. There's five primary things you need to be, you need to do if you want to be a Muslim. These are called the five pillars. And each of them makes sense. Each of them are simple uh, things which have practical value and they help shape your moral character. The first one is the belief that I spoke about. That you believe there's only one God and you believe in all his messengers from Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, right to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and everything that they taught. You believe in this, that's the first pillar. So there's nothing to do there except belief. The second pillar is to pray to God five times a day. Using the method shown to us by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now this prayer, if you just count the obligatory units of prayer, it only makes up approximately half an hour, 30 minutes. 30 minutes of 24 hours God is asking of you. For everything He has given you, He just wants you to put your forehead on the ground for 30 minutes out of 24 hours. Is this something difficult for us to do? Is this asking too much of us? This prayer benefits us in many ways. It, it, they are split up at five such strategic times that they keep us thinking about God all day. And they keep us in this way morally upright. As God mentions in the Quran, Inna salata tanha anil fashahi wal munkar. That this prayer stops you from doing and saying evil things. Because if you are praying to God five times a day, there's a very small chance that you're going to be living a religious life. This prayer is there to stop you from doing these things. This prayer is a communication with your Creator. When Muslims pray to God, we start off, we say, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. Isn't that something good? Then we fold our hands and we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise to God, the Creator of the universe, the Lord of the universe. And according to our beliefs, as Islam teaches us, when we say that in our prayer, God responds. He says, Hamidani Abdi, my slave has praised me. And for every line that we say, God responds. Until when we say the line, Iya kana wa iya kana stain, you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Then He says, Ask me whatever you want, I will grant it to you. And then the next part of our prayer is, Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to that straight path. Guide us to it. And as God just said, I will grant you whatever prayer you want. And now He grants you the guidance. Interestingly, it is the Muslims who are supposedly, you know, on the straight path, who God tells us 17 times a day minimum to pray to Him for guidance. You know why? We may be on the straight path in some parts of our lives, but there might be other issues where we're still wrong. Okay, we got the right beliefs. Maybe our practice is not in order. Maybe the other issues of our beliefs are not in order. Maybe we're not treating people properly. We need God's guidance until the day we die. This is what a Muslim believes. And that's why 17 times every day we make this prayer. It only takes up altogether half an hour from the entire day. Is this much for God to ask for? Is this not something logical that makes sense in this whole relationship with God? 
He asks us to give 2.5% of our money in charity. Charity is a good thing. This helps those who are not on the same level as us economically. And this charity is only compulsory on those who have savings. If you are just earning enough to live month to month, you don't have to pay the charity. But if you have savings for over a year, over a certain amount of money, then you just give 2.5% away in charity, which is really nothing. That's the minimum charity. Of course, Muslims are encouraged to give a lot more. You fast in the month of Ramadan. This is one of the pillars of Islam. And this fast, I can tell you, is the most beautiful spiritual experience. Some non-Muslims think, poor Muslims, they don't eat from sunrise to sunset for 29 days. I can tell you, every Muslim in the audience says, I can't do it for Ramadan. It's the most beautiful time of the year. I love fasting. Because it's that spiritual experience. You need to become a Muslim to really experience it and understand it. And finally, for those who can afford it, just once in your lifetime, you need to make the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Makkah. I came, just came back from there in October, where I made the Hajj, Alhamdulillah. And I can tell you it is an amazing experience. Millions of Muslims are gathered in one place. I met Muslims from races I did not know existed, who spoke languages I didn't even know existed. From countries I didn't, I've never heard of, but they were Muslims, all of us gathered in one place as one ummah, all worshipping the Creator together. This creates this unity amongst the world, amongst people from every part of the world. It kills racism, it kills tribalism, and it brings about universal brotherhood. You want universal brotherhood? Become a Muslim and go for Hajj, you will experience it in Makkah. I guarantee you that. So these are the five pillars of Islam. Very simple, very logical, very straightforward. This is the bare minimum you need to do to maintain your relationship with God. There's really nothing Islam asks you which is difficult. In fact, this is a bit of a diversion again, but in Islam, if you study Islamic law, one of the principles of Islamic law agreed upon by all scholars is the religion is easy. A lot of non-Muslims, even other Muslims must be thinking, what? The religion is easy? It's one of the most difficult religions I ever heard of. But no, the more you study Islam, the more you begin to realize that it's an easy religion. Now if you compare Islam to not practicing any religion at all, then no matter how easy Islam is, it's still going to look difficult. If you don't pray at all, even praying one time a day seems difficult. But if you, call, if you compare the rituals of Islam to other religions as a whole, it's very easy. And some religions don't allow you to get married if you want to become righteous. Islam tells you to be righteous, you must get married. It's compulsory. It's part of your religion. Some religions to be righteous, you need to go live in the mountains and don't eat and put yourself to a lot of hardship. Islam says that's prohibited. Don't cause harm to your body. Live a social life. Live with the community and grow as a Muslim in that way. It's a simple religion. You just need to get to know it better if you think it's difficult. So this is a Muslim, this is a relationship with God which I believe every human being needs to establish. But this is not the ideal relationship. This is the primary relationship. This is the minimum that you need to do. There are people in the world who are very rare and only God knows them because only God knows what is in our hearts. But they have reached the ideal level of their relationship with God. These people are the friends of God, known in Arabic as awliya Allah, the friends of Allah. Only Allah knows them, because his friendship of Allah is based on one's iman and on one's uh, piety, and only God knows who is pious and who is not. But this is the relationship that every human being must work towards. It's not enough that we just worship him, but we want to be as close to him as possible. We want to feel his love. We want to be from those who are considered his friends. There is a narration on the Prophet.